morning. Welcome to Faith Church. We are here to reach up in worship to an amazing God. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for the full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Turn to somebody and give them a morning. <laughs> announcements. We had a couple of great days at VBS this week. Big thank you to all the volunteers in Jordan. Uh, he, there's no youth group tonight because he is away. Uh, he sent an email out last week to the youth group families about August activities, so be sure to read over them. All are invited to participate in the Zoom prayer meeting this Wednesday evening at 645. Um, you should have gotten an email. If you didn't, just call the church or email and we'll get it to you. And also, on your way to the exit doors or the offering plates. And let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, here we are. Here we are, God. We have little power, humble circumstances, yet lifting up our hearts and voice to you before whom all created things are like dust and vapor. You are hidden behind the curtain of our senses. You're incomprehensible. Yet here we speak to you with the intimacy of a child to a parent 
If we could not speak to you like this, then we would indeed be without hope in the world. Of all that will come to us today, very little will be what we have chosen to do. It is for you who determines our future and the bounds of our habitation. It is you who has the power to put in our hands something to do. And in other people, their hands something to do. And withhold the skill to do another thing. It is you who keeps your grasp on the threads of this day's life. And who alone knows what lies before us. But because you are our Father, we are not afraid. Because it is your own spirit that stirs within our spirit's inmost place. And we know that. What we desire for ourselves, we cannot attain. But what you desire in us, you can attain for us. The good that we wish we could do, we do not do. But the good that you desire to do in us, that you are able to give me the power to do it. Dear Father, take this day's life into your own care. Control all of our thoughts and our feelings. Direct our energies, instruct our minds, sustain our wills, take our hands and our feet and make them swift to do what you've called us to do. Take our eyes and keep them fixed upon your beauty. Take our lips as we speak and make them eloquent in testimony to your love. For all of us, make this a day of obedience, a day of spiritual joy and peace. Make this day's part of the work of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name these prayers are said. Amen.
the word uh, PR? What, do you, what comes to your mind? For me, it is a personal record. Like if you're at the gym and you do something, get a deadlift. It's the most you've ever done. That's, is, that, is that a PR, Tony? Yes, they get ring the bell. <laughs> the fastest mile you've ever run, you got a PR. Now, some people think um, public relations when you hear PR. Uh, when I was in the newspaper business, a PR was a press release. And my roommate in college, to him, PR meant where he was from. His family was from Puerto Rico. But sometimes people use this expression. You don't talk about PR. Mark Twain said, you never discuss politics or religion in polite company. And polite company just means a group of people that you don't know very well. I had to look that up. I was like, polite company? But in rude company, you could do it, but it just means people you don't know. And now, I find it really difficult to not talk about religion in church, but, um, but why would they say never discuss politics or religion in polite company? Because nothing gets people, what's a good word, riled up more than God and the flag. It's no secret that Religion and politics have created this unholy union <laughs> that they've merged together in the political realm for probably, I would say, for at least the last 30 years. I'm trying to think back of how the first time I could vote was like 1980, yeah, I guess 88 would have been the first time. Um, but we have, I don't know if this is a good word, we have politicized religion and we've religionized politics because everybody wants to have some kind of Jesus in their thing and they've got Bible verses to kind of prove what they're going to say but there's this attitude I don't know it's a fear it's a fear where there's certain things that we fear and it's either political cultural economic there's military issues and all of us vote based on some of those things so never discuss politics or religion in polite company because nothing raises money better than fear. We have gotten at least 10 in the last week political mail and every single one of them had like a dark shade of the person they don't want you to vote for, right? It's like a, a terrible picture and it says, you know, they're going to do this if you don't. And I'm like... Man, fear is powerful. We have people in our lives. I know people that have lost friends over politics. I know family members who have stopped talking to each other. I don't ever remember a time, I would say until the last like four years, that the country is that divided. Like, I remember being able to talk about it with people, no matter where that I work, we could talk about stuff, and it wasn't as heated as it is now. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said. He said, I never considered a difference of opinion about politics or religion as a cause for withdrawing from a friend. And he's right. We have created this atmosphere. And for the church, we should know better. We know what's going on. Now, for a number of years, I've taken a fast of social media. And that means, you know, no social media at all. And it's usually been really good. And about two weeks ago, I just did a few days of one. Like, and I was like, oh. Man, I just feel better, just not constantly going to it. There's one podcaster that I follow, and he does nothing for a month every year. He doesn't have TV. He doesn't, nothing, no kind of news, no social media, no nothing. And then somebody will come, and they will interview him. And when they're interviewing him, they tell all the things that have happened in that month. Do you know what? There's always another thing. I couldn't keep up because people said, 
Pastor Tony, why don't you post on that? Because there's always going to be something else. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, like, what's your opinion about this? I don't, I don't have enough time to become an expert in something and then give my opinion when I really don't know that much about it. And I don't know if I trust the information that I'm given. And I would say over the last month, we've been given information. I've had an opinion. I mean, because we all have an opinion. And then a week later, more information comes out. And I'm like, oh, I have another opinion now. No, no, that has not happened to anybody? Yes. If you, okay, one person back there. Thank you. <laughs> Never discuss it because fear is powerful. And what do we fear, really? I mean, think about it, the things you fear of which way it will go. You don't have to say, I don't want you to say it out loud. I just want to give you a minute to think of some. You know, loss of control, because power is a huge motivator. Opportunity, wealth, freedom, our progress. Am I going to lose control? Am I going to lose an opportunity to do something? Am I going to lose any of my money? Am I going to lose any of my freedom? What command does Jesus give the most? And this is so amazing. Jesus gives the most. And I'll just tell you, do, do not fear. Fear not. And he even does it all the way until his disciples, until he's getting ready to be crucified. And he's telling them, fear not. And he's praying for them. And we're going to look at one of those prayers in a minute. There is literally a religious group of powerful people that hate him. There is a powerful empire that is going to try to and kill him. Now think about that. And then he's got this other group of people that aren't getting it. That he's been hanging around for three years and been telling them everything that they should be doing. And they're always like, no, we shouldn't go to Jerusalem. I've told you three times we have to go to Jerusalem. It's the Father's will. So he prays. Now here's what my question is. If he says fear not, can we, and yes we can, just say yes we can before I even tell you what it is. Yes we can because it's biblical. Can we disagree politically and still love unconditionally? And, and I don't mean, I don't mean <laughs> tolerate the person. Can we, do you even want to, as a person that follows Jesus, do you even want to disagree with somebody politically and love them unconditionally? Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to do anything that God has called us to do, but do you even want to do that? I don't, I don't mean be nice and just kind of roll your eyes when they walk away. Don't just sit there and go, oh, I just wish they would stop talking. No, that's not loving unconditionally. Are we, are we willing to evaluate our faith, our faith in Jesus Christ, and then filter that through our politics? Rather than create create a vision for what we want politically and then try to find verses to back that up. What did my professor call that? Exegesis is when you study Scripture and you bring out of Scripture and pre preach what's in Scripture, what the Bible says. Anegesis is the word. It's not a real word, but anegesis is this is what I want to think. Let me find some verses to preach on it. And I remember him saying, that is not preaching. That is you having your opinion of something. I got this great sermon. Just let me find a verse. It was funny in class. I guess it's not as funny to you guys. It was, in class, we were laughing. It was like, because we've known people that have done that. I heard a pastor one time preach a whole sermon. It must have been 45 minutes when I was in college on a verse that wasn't there. 
I, I, I think I can still remember it. 19, 1988. In Genesis. People are watching online. They're like, what, what is he doing? <laughs> There's just a thought that came in my head. You're like, oh, don't shake his hand. Well, you can't shake my hand anyway. <laughs> so is it? 16. Listen to the last verse in Genesis 16. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. That's the last verse. The first verse in 17, chapter 17, is this. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. How many years is that? Ninety-nine minus eighty-six. He preached an entire sermon on Abraham backsliding between those two verses. Because God didn't write anything that was going on. And I remember because I was sitting on the front row. And I got in trouble for this, but I was sitting. And he's going on and on and on and on and on. And I just went like this. I went... And I looked at the kid beside me. I'm like, where is he getting this from? You got this whole Bible to preach on. And then they were like, "Uh, Tony, you need to see the dean. It was not very Christian. Didn't agree with him anyway, but that was, why would you spend a whole sermon? You got 500 kids that that are going to listen to you. I mean, they have to because you're in chapel. (laughs) But why would you do it on something that's not even there? Listen, the greatest, the greatest issues are not temporal, but eternal. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? So what if we win? What if your person politically, government, state, federal, whatever, wins or doesn't win. Are we willing to follow Jesus? Let's make it person, personal. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of faith in Jesus Christ rather than create a version of faith that supports your politics? We know where we can get the information, right? I know where I know where to go when I want to be in the echo chamber of what I already think. I can I can do that. I can do that quickly. But as Christians, are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of faith in Jesus Christ rather than create a version of faith that supports our politics? Now, I'll say this. I believe that we need to be involved as Christians in our culture. And so I think we should... I did have this funny quote. Where did I put it? Did I leave it down there? Oh, well, I'll say it in a minute. I do believe in our culture that we should be involved, that we should vote. And I think we should vote righteousness. If we have a, the ability to vote for something that Jesus would want in our culture. We should vote for that. All the time remembering that our main objective is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way a culture is really going to change is not who's in office anywhere. The only way our culture changes is if the gospel of Jesus Christ goes to earth and more people become Christians. That's how it's going to change. There's going to be nothing else that changes except the spiritual condition of each and every one of us. If that happens, and there's unity in that, you change the world. But you could get a political person in there, and then all of a sudden you're surprised because now they're lying. They told us this, that, oh, that's never happened. As in, I was watching this one guy, and they were like, I don't remember his name. He, they said, are you glad you retired from politics? He, he goes, yes. 
I'm tired of lying. And they went. And he goes, every year I would pull out, yes, I'm going to make the schools better. Yes, we're going to fix. He goes, we never even planned on any of that. (laughs) And I went, wow, he, he is being brutally honest. The interview didn't last long. I don't know, maybe if the interviewer knows where his bread's buttered. Is that an expression y'all use up here? You know what it means though, right? Okay, good. Instead, let, let us let what we believe about a culture go through what we are as Christians. Because most Christians, I don't think, do this. And apparently, Jesus saw this coming. We didn't see it coming, but Jesus saw it coming because he, he saw that there was going to be divisions amongst Christians. And that the division was going to take place in the church. And he's only looking at his guys when he prays this. But he's praying for us too. And you're like, what's the prayer? Well, I'll get to it. That was the intro. Okay. John records Jesus' prayer right before he's getting ready to get arrested. Right before he's getting ready to get arrested. John records his prayer. And Jesus prays for his disciples and for us. And this is an amazing prayer. Jesus prayed a prayer request to the Father. Now, imagine you're sitting in a circle at camp. Jesus is there with you, and you're holding hands. Does anybody have a prayer request? And Jesus said, I've got a prayer request. That's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to have a prayer request. I thought that was funny. But anyway. <laughs> John 17. Father, the hour has come. This is why Jesus came. It's come. It's time. All these years I've been here. I've been with these guys three years. But all this time, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. The hour in which God is going to be the most glorified. We would be horrified by it. Because we probably wouldn't be able to even look at it. We would have looked away. The disciples didn't understand. And we would not have understood either if we would have been them at that time. We get to understand now because we get to read it. Verse 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they, he's talking about his disciples, and later me and you, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. What's next is amazing. And I don't think most Christians even think about this. Here's the prayer request. Here's the prayer request of Jesus. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me. Listen, there is a purpose clause. Protect them. Why? To what end? From what? What do we need protection from? Now we know that All of the disciples are going to get beaten at some point, and almost all of them get martyred. Still in verse 11, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be. So now, now this is important. Here is Jesus' one prayer request for his followers, and here's what Jesus wanted protection for. So that they may be one as we are one. Wow. I mean, that is a prayer request. Unity, oneness. My prayer is not for them alone. It's not just the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Did you get that? Not only do... I want them to have the unity like the Father, Son have. I want them to know and that also be the prayer request to the people that they tell. So the disciples and then the people they shared the gospel with and that they shared the gospel with all the way up to us. Somebody shared. That's the most important message and I want them to know that. Now what we pray for us Probably part of the problem is we haven't prayed this prayer 
at all or enough. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe, who, who will believe in me through their message. Hmm. That's all of them. The first century, the Jews, the Gentiles, the Romans, Samaritan, women, slaves, freedmen, soldiers, tax collectors, the educated people, wealthy people, unwealthy, unwealthy, or poor. Is unwealthy even a word? Poor, all of that. But the most important thing is I want them to be unified with one message. Jesus prayed, I pray for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Now, this sounds impossible, right? I mean, it's hard to get an agreement or unity in a small group of people. Can you imagine trying to do it where everybody in the church is different and come from different backgrounds, different places? It's hard to imagine. Jesus is praying. It sounds impossible. Can you just imagine all the disciples are all holding hands it's hard to get people to. <laughs> so they're all praying. And he's, I'm praying for unity. And then Peter goes, he's talking about you, James. You're the one that always causes problems. James, like, it's not me. The tax collector over there. And Jesus, Jesus with every head bowed and every eye closed. <laughs> uh. If you didn't hear me, that's okay. <laughs> that was just my little aside. Jesus is praying for his disciples that th they would be one. He was convinced. He knew this ahead of time. Before his mission was going to be accomplished, there was going to be something necessary. There was going to be something essential. There was going to be something crucial. It was an imperative that there had to be unity within the church so that my message could go out. I think we should be intentional then. We should on purpose realize that it's an imperative. And that we should intentionally try to build unity. That's why over and over again when the Apostle Paul is writing. He's like, and I hear there are divisions among you. And people that cause divisions. People that gossip or slant. All of those things that cause division. That's not what I want for the church. We should have more in common with other believers than anybody else. Even our own families. We should have more in common with other believers. Now, if everybody in our family is a Christian, then we should have more in common. But do you, do you know what I mean? Like more in common with other Christians than anybody else. We should have more solidarity. More than... People of the same race, more than income levels, more than political parties. The body of Christ, there should be more unity in us than anything else. Father, just as you are in me, Jesus prayed, and I am in you, may they, may they, the disciples, in verse 21, and us later, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us. So that, now, now think about this. So that what? Do you know why Jesus is calling for this kind of oneness? So that we would just get along? No. I mean, you're trying to do that to your children, right? You just need to get along. We're, it's going to be a long drive. We just need to get along. No, but this is more than that. It doesn't have anything really to do with us. May they also be in us so that the world, so that everybody in the world, so that everybody in the world, may they also be in us so that everyone in the world, people outside of faith, everybody that doesn't know Jesus, people that have different worldviews, everybody that's not a Christian, that the world, may they also be in us so that the world may believe now, th translate that, you can also say, be convinced. That the world would be convinced of Jesus because of our unity. You're like, 
I think that's going to be impossible. But here's the amazing thing. We're here. All these thousands of years, we're here now because the message continued to go. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you, who was praying, that you, Jesus praying, to the Father in heaven, that you, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So when we, the Father loved you and he sent Jesus, how are they going to be convinced of that message? Because we argue really good? No, because we love each other. May the world believe that you have sent me. He was asking his Father to push us his disciples, towards what he commanded us to do earlier that same evening. Just a few hours earlier, Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. It is the last Passover, first communion. And Jesus is sitting there and he goes, uh, and he had just washed the disciples' feet, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Can you imagine? Jesus is sitting there. He knows what's getting ready to come up. This was a new command, not a new suggestion. Again, he said, it's about Jesus, his mission, his mission through us. Jesus is sitting there, and he just had said, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me. And then Peter, he's like, Peter, sit down. You're going to deny you even know me three times before the morning. Peter's like, I'm not. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another as I've loved you. How much did Jesus love us, his disciples? To die. That's how the world is going to do. We love each other like that. Back to, back to Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 22. I have given them the glory I have given them the glory that you gave me. So imagine Jesus praying. You gave me that they may be one as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Complete unity. Just imagine that kind of unity. Not just political unity, not just neighborhood unity. Then, and here's that word again. Here it is again. It's not about us. Verse 23. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus is praying. You love them as much as you love me. I mean... That is amazing love. Even while we were still sinners. Even while we were his enemy. Before Jesus ascends back up to heaven. He says I want you to go into all the world. I want you to go into all the world. And make disciples of every nation. Every nation. I want you to go everywhere. And the church will. And when we get to heaven, we are not going to recognize the people that were believers thousands of years ago, 600 years ago, that we're not even going to, we'll just be, it's everybody. They'll be so, it'll be awesome. That, think about that. Before he goes back, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to all the nations and I will be with you always even to the very end of the age. And after the resurrection, the church gets launched and it has a purpose to make the disciples of all nations. They have a message. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the king who came to reverse back to what everything is supposed to be. He's the only king that he'll go and die for his subjects to create a way to the Father. Listen, whoever your candidates are, whoever group on Tuesday in November 
they will win or lose, and time will go on. But beloved, the church wins or loses based on our behavior between now and then. Remember, it was Christianity that shaped the Western world. They say most of it goes to the Apostle Paul. What he wrote and what he preached. There's this justice and dignity and freedom for individual people. Now listen, our country's a short history. And political parties have come and gone. I'm trying to think. The Whig Party? Is there anybody still in the Whig Party? No? <laughs> As followers of the eternal king, why would we allow ourselves to be divided by temporary elected officials? Why would we allow a political view that we might change our mind? Why would we let a political view divide us from the living breathing body of Christ. The spiritual condition of a person's soul is infinitely more important than any political matter on the face of the earth. There's a you beside you. Look at the person beside you. That's a you beside you. There's a next door to you. There's people you're related to. Why would we not fight, struggle, sacrifice for the unity that the king prayed for? So let's do this. Here's what we do. We pray it. We pray for oneness. And I'll make it a simple prayer. Here, Heavenly Father, make us one. Okay, just pray that. Heavenly Father, make us one. Okay, louder. Heavenly Father, make us one. So if we're one, we are going to have the message for many. Right? Second, this is your job. I'm going to ask you next week to raise your hand. So you have to do this. Look for an opportunity to love unconditionally someone that you disagree with politically. You're like, I am not coming back next week. <laughs> I'll pray for you. Listen, there is a, a first century rabbi thinking about this, standing in this hot sun with these guys that still haven't got it. And he's only hours away from being arrested. And he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And he did. And it didn't. And he did. He did build his church. And the gates of hell did not overcome it. And we're part of that. And our oneness, our unity is the key to affecting the next the whole next generation of Christians are going to see how we love each other. And how we love each other, the world sees, and that's how they know. So disagree politically, but you love unconditionally. We pray for unity and we look. Let's bow our heads. I want you to be praying this. Father, look. Jesus prayed as you and me are one. That is so difficult, Lord. It's going to have to be through your power in us to be able to do this. We thank you for the promise of your word. For every truth. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds to see the salvation that we have received. That we are so blessed and we are so grateful. And you are showing that love by loving those who love you. And love each other. And we ask now that you would work in every heart. In every heart. That we would bring glory to you. That those people that don't know you. Would see our love. Our unity. Our oneness. And it would point them to Jesus. And we will spend forever. In your presence. Pouring out praise and it will never grow old. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.